This video is sponsored by Endel. Astronomy, at least as we define it today, can be described broadly as the science that deals with celestial objects, space, and the physical universe. Astrology, on the other hand, is the study and interpretation of the movement of celestial bodies, such as stars, planets, comets, eclipses, and other objects, and how they might affect one's life or events in the world. Pretty much any modern scientist will tell you that astrology is not a science. In ancient Mesopotamia, though, there was no distinction between the two. What we call astronomy and astrology were one and the same. In that world, the movement of the heavens was literally carried out by heaven, or specifically, the various deities who occupied that space. Perhaps nowhere else was the study and interpretation of the heavens more developed than in ancient Babylonia. Babylonian astrologers were renowned for their mastery of astrology and divination, or the ability to prognosticate future events. We saw in a past video on the Library of Nineveh all of the trouble that kings such as Isarhaddon and Ashurbanipal went through in order to obtain astronomical data and divination texts from the various cities and shrines of Babylonia. After all, the Babylonians had been at it much longer than anyone else in the world. They had more experience and expertise in such things, or so it was widely believed. Basically, if you really wanted the most knowledgeable scholars, who could perhaps provide the most accurate interpretation, then you should consult Babylonian scholars and diviners. I'd like to take a few moments to thank the sponsor of this video, Endel. Now, Endel is this really cool app that takes everything we know about sound and combines it with cutting-edge AI technology to create real-time, personalized soundscapes that are designed to help you relax, focus, and sleep. These real-time and personal inputs can include one's location, the weather, even your heart rate, to create the most soothing soundscape for you. Endel works on your phone, tablet, iWatch, and all related devices so you can pretty much use it anywhere. Since I've been using Endo for the past couple of weeks, I myself have definitely experienced much better sleep, which I'd estimate has helped to at least double my productivity. So if Endo sounds, no pun intended, like something you'd be interested in, you can try it out for free. The first 100 people to download Endo with the link in the video description will get a free week of audio experiences. So check it out, and be on your way to better focus, relaxation, and sleep with Endel. The Babylonians' reputation in such, we'll call them, sciences, spread further west into the Greek-speaking world during the Classical era. Aristotle, in his work, On the Heavens, states that along with the Egyptians, it is the Babylonians who have made observations for very many years and from whom we have many reliable pieces of information about each of the stars. Other Greek and Roman sources more or less state the same thing, though the actual dates they give for the length of this tradition are clearly stretched. For example, Diodorus Siculus states that the Babylonians, who he and other writers call Chaldeans, claim that they have been observing the heavens for at least 473,000 years before the conquest of Babylon by Alexander the Great. Pliny the Elder takes it back a few millennia further to 720,000 years before his own time. Of course, these are not possible, and who knows how their sources came up with these numbers. But it's clear that both of them, as well as others in antiquity, were highly impressed with the Babylonians' long tradition of scholarship and systematic observation of the night sky. Diodorus marvels at and writes admiringly about the Babylonians' willingness to dedicate themselves to the study of the heavens. The training which they undertake in all these subjects is not the same as that of the Greeks who pursue such studies. For among the Chaldeans, the higher study of these subjects is handed down within the family and son takes it over 
from father, being exempt from all other public duties. Since they are brought up studying these disciplines from childhood, they acquire great skill in them, both because of how easy it is to teach the young, and because of the great amount of time devoted to the process. Among the Greeks, on the other hand, the man who applies himself to many subjects without preparation reaches higher study late, and then, after laboring at it for a little while, he abandons it, distracted by the need to make a living. Given the Babylonians' reputation in the realm of astrology and divination, there was a demand amongst Greek scientists and mathematicians for some of the rare data that they'd been recording for millennia. While most Greeks may not have believed in all of the supernatural reasons for such phenomena, they were interested in obtaining and analyzing such data to help them support or disprove their ideas about how the universe worked. As an example, let's take a look at the great mathematician, astronomer, geographer, and all-out Renaissance man, 1500 years before the actual Renaissance, Ptolemy of Alexandria. In one of his works, called Almagest, written sometime between 150 and 161 AD, Ptolemy uses the records of 18 lunar eclipses, the first 10 of which he claims were observed in Babylon. One of these is an eclipse that took place in 720 BC, during the reign of the Babylonian king Marduk Apla Idina II, who he calls Mardu Kempados. Ptolemy writes, The second of the eclipses is recorded as having occurred in the second year of the same Mardu Kempados, on the 18th to 19th of the month, Thoth, according to the Egyptian calendar. It was eclipsed, it says, three fingers from the south at midnight. Since the midpoint in Babylon occurred exactly at midnight, in Alexandria it must have happened five-sixths of an hour before midnight, at which time the true position of the sun was Pisces, thirteen and three-quarters degrees. When you think about it, it's quite amazing that the Babylonians kept such meticulous records of the comings and goings of celestial objects, such as eclipses. But why? Unlike the Greeks, they weren't trying to figure out how the universe worked, as for them, this could be primarily explained by the creation myths of their religion. The reason was that eclipses, comets, and other such occurrences were concerning due to the negative events they were thought to herald. These could include large-scale natural disasters, widespread disease, attacks from one's enemies, or the death of a king. And so, recording and interpreting this knowledge was of vital importance. The earliest surviving documents devoted to the subject seem to come from the reign of the Babylonian king, Ami Saduka, between the years 1646 to 1626 BC. His royal astronomers made complex observations of the risings and settings of the planet Venus. Copies of these were found in Ashurbanipal's personal library at Nineveh as part of a group of documents a Syriologist referred to as Anuma Anu Enlil. These texts contain approximately 7,000 different omens based on celestial phenomena pertaining to solar and lunar eclipses as well as planets. It must have been a pretty important series of omens, because copies of Anuma Anu Enlil were also found by archaeologists in the city of Uruk. One particular copy was compiled by a scribe named Anu Abba Uter in the 2nd century BC, when Babylonia was ruled by the Seleucids. One of the tablets from this version of Anuma Anu Enlil mentions various types of eclipses and a range of colors that signify bad omens. If an eclipse occurs on the 14th of Duyuzi and is white, Sin will request votive offerings. If an eclipse occurs on the 14th of Duyuzi and is black, the angry gods will return to the land. If an eclipse occurs on the 14th of Duyuzi and is red, the fields and meadows will be flooded. If an eclipse occurs on the 14th of Duyuzi and is yellow, the enemy will plunder the property of the land. 
if an eclipse occurs on the 14th of Diyuzi and is variegated, in the land of Akkad, the market rate will fall. By the time that Anu Abu Uter was copying this text, Babylonia was becoming increasingly Hellenized, and with every new generation, there were fewer people who could read and write such Akkadian language texts. While Alexandria and Pergamon may have become the ancient world's new centers of scholarship and learning, there was still an interest among many Greek, Roman, and other scholars for the type of ancient knowledge and data that could only be found in places such as Babylon and Uruk. While no Greek translation of texts such as Anuma Anu Enlil have been discovered so far, there is a good deal of evidence indicating that several non-Babylonian scholars may have had access to them, whether through translated written sources or personal contact with the remaining Babylonian scribes and diviners themselves. One such individual may have been Diodorus Siculus, who wrote, The Chaldeans say that sometimes by their risings, sometimes by their settings, and by their color, the planets indicate in advance what is going to happen to those who are willing to observe them closely. Sometimes they indicate great windstorms, sometimes an excess of rain or heat, sometimes the appearance of comets, and also solar and lunar eclipses, and earthquakes, and in general all the conditions which are generated by the atmosphere and are beneficial or harmful, not only to entire peoples or regions, but also to kings and private individuals. It seems that Ptolemy of Alexandria was also familiar with the contents of documents such as Anuma Anu Enlil, at least with regard to eclipses and signs that were generally interpreted to be bad omens. In fact, he lists the same colors as those of the tablet that we just read a few moments earlier. For predicting general conditions, one must also observe the colors relating to eclipses either those of the luminaries themselves, or those of the formations that occur around them, such as rods, halos, or similar. If they appear black or greenish, they signify the effects which were mentioned in relation to the nature of Saturn. If white, of Jupiter. If reddish, of Mars. If yellow, of Venus. If variegated, of Mercury. While ancient Greeks and Romans may have had their own views on eclipses and their meanings, this type of presentation of such phenomena is absent until the Hellenistic period. By the 1st and 2nd century AD, many scholars believe that such ancient knowledge was now being preserved by Greek and Roman scientists, philosophers, and writers in places that are now lost to us, such as the Great Library of Alexandria. These connections between the Greco-Roman world and ancient Mesopotamia are fascinating, and I hope to share more of them with you one day in the future. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this program and thanks so much for watching, or just listening. I'd also really like to thank GrandKek69, Yap de Graf, Pasta Frola, Michael Lewis, Daniel Allen, Danny Van Eck, YNXTV, Robert Morgan, Frank, Tim Lane, Sebastian Hurtado Correa, Franz Robbins, Brendan Redman, Faridun Dadachanji, Jimmy Daruwala, Sher Cam, Farhad Kama, and all of the channel's patrons on Patreon for helping to support this and all future content. Check out the benefits to being a Patreon member, and if you'd like to join, feel free to click the link in the video description. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as continue to listen to special audio programs on the History with Sai podcast. Thanks again, and stay safe.